Hi, we're coming to you from this beautiful campus at Cal State LA amid this glorious architecture framing the Luckman Fine Arts Complex. On today's episode of Scope, we've assembled some fabulous topics which will not only amaze you, but also make you feel good because of the people and stories involved. You can say that again. <laughs> and we'll visit a basketball player by the name of Rocky, who's a famous astrophysicist. We'll call on the most admirable 100-year-old person you'll ever meet. He refuses to retire and is more active than ever. And we'll explore the saga of a family where a two-year-old has a rare disease diagnosed as incurable. Their love and perseverance in the face of adversity brought the youngster back to semi-recovery. So prepare yourselves for a memorable show. You can treat him as a basketball player who regards astrophysics as a diversion or a scientist with sports in his blood. Either way, he's an anomaly. In the world of astronomy, he's known as Mr. Cobb, Rocky Cobb. I'm a much better basketball player than Einstein was, uh, but I, and I'm also a much better physicist than Michael Jordan. So in combining physics and basketball, I'm somewhere in there. Rocky is a professor of astrophysics at the University of Chicago, a scientist at Fermi Laboratory in Batavia, Illinois, and a basketball player whenever he finds the time. His real name is Edward, but he doesn't respond to it. When I was about three years old, I decided I didn't like my given name, Edward, and I wanted another name, so I came up with the name Rocky. I don't remember why, but it's proved very convenient because as far as I know, I'm the world's only astrophysicist named Rocky. <laughs> it isn't just the name that's unusual about this scientist. He's considered one of the foremost experts in the events surrounding the theory of the Big Bang, the explosion that gave birth to the universe. Recently, Cobb traveled to Washington, D.C. to participate in a conference on cosmic occurrences organized by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. The objective of this gathering was to assemble well-known scientists and philosophers to discuss three provocative issues. What came before the Big Bang? What superior force designed the universe? And are we alone in it? Cobb doesn't have a pat answer for any of these questions. His main contribution is the study of the origin of the universe. And one way we study the birth of the universe is to recreate the conditions that were present at the birth of the universe, create conditions of very high temperature and very high density. So we accelerate particles, fundamental particles, protons to very high energy and smash them into other protons. And where they collide, there's a little piece of the primordial soup that we make, a little region of space that today we can recreate the conditions that were present 12 billion years ago in the first second of the history of the universe. We can watch not the big bang that led to the entire universe, but a little bang in the laboratory. According to Rocky, one of the most obvious conclusions in astronomy is that nothing is unique. There are billions of stars like the sun and millions of galaxies like ours. Therefore, intelligent life on other planets can't be ruled out. Well, one thing you have to do is convince yourself that there's intelligent life on Earth. I believe it's almost inevitable that there is intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. Things that we have evidence for now, life from Mars, things like that, is not intelligent life. But we believe intelligent life arose and had its beginning from these one-cell organisms and the microbes that evolved over billions of years to become intelligent life. So what we see in the universe are all the ingredients that are necessary to make intelligent life elsewhere. The type of chemicals out of which we are made, 
hydrocarbons, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. They are abundant elements everywhere in the universe, not just here. Rocky's ambition is to spread knowledge. He's currently engaged in research regarding dark matter, which comprises about 90% of the universe and is still a mystery for scientists. I would like to know what it is. We have reason to believe that it's not normal matter. It's something very unusual. Perhaps it is a fossil remnant of the Big Bang. Perhaps in the primordial soup, there was a new type of particle that hasn't yet been discovered. And we're trying to recreate the primordial soup in the laboratory to try to create the dark matter, to try to understand what most of the mass of the universe is made of. Despite juggling two jobs as a researcher and as a professor, Rocky finds time for his hobbies. Many people think scientists are one-dimensional and spend all their time in the laboratory. I, I spend no more than 20 hours per day in the laboratory, and the rest of my time I enjoy sports, I play basketball, and uh, I like boxing in the sense that I don't mind hitting people, but the other thing, being hit by people, I'm not particularly fond of. According to Cobb, what the average person doesn't see behind tedious facts, logic, and precision is the exceptional creativity of the scientists. A life of science is a very rewarding, enriching experience. I find it a creative enterprise. You create ideas and you write and you interact with people and come together to create new knowledge. The rewards in science are not always financial. But I think the rewards, the self-fulfillment that one feels in creating knowledge is something that I wouldn't trade for a much higher paid salary doing something else. He's 100 years old, but he's more active than ever. And he's got more energy and resilience than an average person half his age. Despite his advanced age, Frederick William Sunderman isn't entirely satisfied with his accomplishments to date. After all, he's only been a physician, a writer, professor, newspaper editor, scientist, photographer, then violinist. From Monday to Friday, you'll find Frederick at Pennsylvania Hospital, where he edits the medical journal that he founded 30 years ago, Annals of Clinical Science and Laboratory. Oh, I'll never retire, no. No. There's a joy in working. My friends retire and they go down to Florida to play golf, you know. Well, they play a couple rounds of golf every week for the first year and they have a cocktail at night. Then the second year they play only once a week and they have a cocktail also at noon. And then the third week where they don't play at all and they have an eye opener in the morning. And it's a very dull life and they just live down there to die. Dr. Sunderman started to work when he was a young boy delivering newspapers. People must realize that there's a joy in work. And that's the secret of longevity? That and a happy family life. Dr. Sunderman was born in Altoona, Pennsylvania. Being an only child, he was supported and stimulated by his parents to succeed in life. His love for music started at home. Well, my mother started me out on the violin when I was five, and I've kept it up. I play, I practice every day for an hour at night before I go to bed. Dr. Sunderman married twice. The first marriage lasted 45 years, the second 25. Even though he's outlived two wives and two of three sons, that doesn't depress him. His recipe for survival is health and optimism. I think it's, it's important to have a daily schedule of what you're going to do and keep doing it. And um, I, I believe it's important to have a good position and maintain it and like it. In World War II, Dr. Sunderman worked on the Manhattan Project that culminated in the development of the atomic bomb. This is a part of the Alamogordo bomb. That was the first bomb that was dropped, experimental bomb. And uh, this is part of the ground where it hit. 
He still feels that the bomb should have been dropped in the desert to show the Japanese its devastating effect and thus force them to surrender instead of the carnage that took place. But Truman decided otherwise and he dropped bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and burned up about a quarter of a million people. And uh, I was very, very saddened by that because I, we'd worked for, a number of us worked for three years, but we didn't work to kill people. Dr. Sunderman was born at a time when trolleys were being pulled by horses. He recollects the early automobiles, the first Morse code transmission, and the invention of radio, television, and more recently, computers. You'd think that this would make us happier, but I think the last century was a much a happier century. People were not so confused. We've forgotten the ethics of the past generation. We have to come back to that, living a moral life. Last year, Dr. Sunderman finished writing his autobiography, the most recent of his 45 books, of which some have been translated into Italian and Japanese. Writing his memoirs at 100 is a good idea. But when is he going to start on volume two? <laughs> I have so many things to do that I never, I never be able to accomplish them all. The remarkable couple that you're about to meet didn't receive a Nobel Prize, and they aren't physicians. But when doctors gave them no hope regarding their son, they rose to the occasion and proved them wrong. Ready? One, two, three. You gonna fly? Let's go. Whoa! This two-year-old toddler is the apple of his mother's eye. His name is Jacob Sontag, and he was diagnosed when he was seven months old with Medicanavan syndrome, a genetic illness that causes deterioration of the brain. Children suffering from this rare disease undergo gradual loss of sight, swallowing, and a general loss of immunity until they reach total paralysis. When Jacob was first diagnosed, his doctors said, you know, this is what it is, Mrs. Sontag. Jacob will succumb to seizures. He'll lose his ability to eat. He'll lose his eyesight. Um, you know, you, you need to just deal with this and go home and, and, and make him as comfortable as possible. And my first question was, you know, what about gene therapy? And it, he said, oh, it's 10 years down the road, pie in the sky, please, Mrs. Suntag, you must accept this. <laughs> Jacob's parents, Jordana and Richard, knew that they couldn't wait. Jacob's health was deteriorating daily. Jordana used all the resources available to her as a publicist and as president of the Canavan Research Foundation to find a solution. And we took Jacob's life into our own hands and searched for other families and doctors out there that were, that were doing something, raising money for something or, or any type of treatment out there, and we found it. And it was in New Zealand that they found what they were looking for. In 1996, New Zealander neurologist Dr. Matthew During was the first physician in the world to apply genetic therapy on children with Canavan syndrome. Today, he's a professor of gene therapy at the Thomas Jefferson Medical Center in Philadelphia. Well, Jacob Sontag has a, a, what we call a neurogenetic disease, a, a disease which is caused by mutations in a single gene. So it makes good sense to actually either correct that gene or put in a replacement gene. And at this stage, we haven't developed the technology to correct genes, so it really means the only way we can really think about curing these diseases is putting a healthy copy of the gene back in. The perseverance of the Sontag family left an indelible mark on the history of medicine. You know where you are, don't you? Medicanavan was the first brain disease treated with the genetic therapy, and Jacob was the first beneficiary. The genetic mutation with which Jacob was born impedes the formation of myelin, which is the membrane that covers the brain nerves and the medulla. Myelin is responsible for the transmission of nervous impulses throughout the body. The injection of healthy genes into Jacob's brain stimulates the formation of myelin and stops the deterioration. Every three months, Jordana and Richard take Jacob to the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, where Dr. During monitors his myelin level. 
Uh, the MRI shows signs of new myelin growth. Jacob, as a result of a gene therapy in the frontal area of his brain, is showing um, an increased signal in the white matter, which is myelin. We assume that we've stabilized him, but we don't know. We know that we've done something because he hasn't shown signs of deterioration. Um, and we know we've done something because of all of the data we received from the MRI and we've, the improvements we see in his MRI and other tests that he has and his therapist. And so we don't know. We don't know. In the United States today, there are almost 1,000 children that suffer from the same disease as Jacob's, but research to provide results is slow. That sort of research is traditionally supported through governments, foundations, or, or drug companies, and there's no drug company which will ever develop a product for a disease, for cannabis disease, because there's so few children, they will never make money out of something like that. Dr. During admits that Jacob would have had no chance of recovery if it weren't for his parents' dedication and pressure. So one family or a couple of families that actually can mobilize support can actually change the direction of scientists and actually really push these things forward. I think you always need to temper that with responsible science and not be over influenced by parents whose, although their goals are always for the best of their child, may take risks and don't have the scientific knowledge to be able to judge the, the potential risks and limitations of the treatment that you're doing. But having to go through that review process was excruciating. My child was deteriorating by the second. The good thing about this field particularly is that it's very, very tightly regulated. So it's not just an individual who makes that decision. It's actually ethical committees and various regulatory committees who can then sit back more um, impartially from that family and not be persuaded by them. So I certainly wouldn't inject something that they just started working on last week into my child. So I, I don't want to kill him in the process of, of moving protocols along, but certainly there is a, there is a fine line and, and we need to maybe um, define that more. For that reason, this courageous mother, 28 years old, reached as high as the U.S. Congress for support. Her efforts were tireless. She used every conceivable means to call attention to her cause, from senators, to the press, to the internet. One of her objectives is to get legislation approved that allows a maximum of 40 days for a terminal patient to be allowed to use an experimental treatment. Currently, the process takes 18 months. If it's viable for that patient, it shouldn't have to go through a year and a half review process because in a year and a half that patient could be dead. So what I'm proposing is that protocols of this type that could be labeled as priorities because their patients are quickly deteriorating or dying should go through a quicker review process. I'm not going to stop until I see it done. Jordana has the support of other parents with children in similar situations. One of them is Augusto Odone, famous for the scientific advances concerning his son, Lorenzo. This true story was popularized in the film Lorenzo's Oil. Lorenzo had a similar illness, needing myelin to survive. Augusto defied the doctors and invented an oil that prolonged Lorenzo's life. Today, it's used by children all over the world. Augusto, who lives in the U.S., is president of a foundation that helps multiple sclerosis victims. Presently, they're receiving cell transplants that produce myelin. The preliminary results would be known uh, relatively in a relatively short time because after three or four months, they should uh, uh, detect remyelination. But of course, if it goes well with the adults, then uh, uh, Lorenzo would be the next one in line, and Jacob would. MS isn't the only illness that impacts parents like the Sontags or Adones. Other cerebral diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's will also ultimately benefit from their research and efforts. I gotta say, where brain disease is concerned and brain injury and brain cancer, I really feel that the treatments or cures are gonna be in collaborative methods. Gene therapy and, let's say, bone marrow. Gene therapy and stem cell, maybe gene therapy, stem cell, and bone marrow. I think it's gonna be a collaborative approach that really rids the world of brain disease and brain injury and brain cancer as we know it today. You, 
I sound silly. Say hi. My name's Jacob. Jacob, while waiting for his next genetic therapy session, is concentrating on the use of his voice. Jacob was meant to be here. He is a ray of light. He's an unbelievable little boy. You've met him, you've seen him. He, his smile, his laugh can uh, light up anyone's day. Are you over here? <laughs> the fact that he's able to vocalize and, and drink from a cup now. He's moved from a bottle to a cup and he's able to still eat on his own without a feeding tube and he's able to communicate. I mean, these are like, uh, these are gifts to me. Before Jacob, I, I didn't know how to connect with somebody who wasn't quote unquote normal. And it, he's just changed me as a human being. And he's just very delicious. Just very delicious. Yes. Mwah. I'm so blessed to have him in my life. It's an incredible experience. It's an incredible journey. And if I can make him walk, then, oh, then it'll be all worth it. I just smell something. Ooh. Those were some wonderful stories. Yes, I know. Two ends of the spectrum, a hundred-year-old and a supposedly incurable two-year-old, both doing well. It inspires you to live life to the fullest. It sure does. We hope we've inspired you to watch more scopes in the future. So until then, farewell.